Okay, this is concept three notes on the periodic table. So we've already talked about it a good bit, but now we're going to really get into it. We kind of had to do a good bit of background info in concepts one and two in order to really understand um, what we're going to talk about in this concept. So make sure if you haven't watched or learned concept one and two, you go back and do that first so you're not super confused. So the periodic table. It is a table organizing all of the elements that we currently know to exist, and it organizes them by atomic number and chemical properties. And we're going to talk about how it's organized in this concept. So first, let's talk about the groups. These are the vertical columns on the periodic table. They're called groups, and some periodic tables actually say groups on there, so you can kind of see that. All elements in the same group, so in the same column, have the same number of valence electrons. So bonus points, if you remember from concept one, we said that valence electrons are the electrons in an atom's outermost energy level in their electron cloud. And this is essential because this affects how atoms will bond together to form compounds, which we'll talk about in our next unit. But for now, what you need to understand is how many there are. So every element in group one has one valence electron. Group two, they all have two valence electrons. Now, we're going to skip the transition metals in groups thir three through 12, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but then skip to group 13 has three, group 14 uh, has four, 15 has five, 16 has six, 17 has seven, all the way until group 18 has eight valence electrons. So it follows this nice little pattern if you just skip those transition metals. Now, the only exception to this group 18 is helium. It actually only has two, and we'll talk about it in just a minute and why is it in group 18 if it doesn't have eight. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, because they have the same number of valence electrons, this gives them a lot of the same chemical properties because it's affecting how they're going to bond, and we'll learn more about that in the future. So, if you have a periodic table that you want to label, I would do that for studying purposes. So again, this is group one, has one, everything in this one has one valence electron. And then all of these have two. All of those have three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Again, with the exception of helium, which we'll talk about why in a little bit. Now, because they have similar properties, the groups also have special group names. And I want you to know some of these group names, okay? So these are the ones you need to know. Group one are the alkali metals. These are the most reactive metals. They really, really, really want to bind with other elements. Now, note, for metals, reactivity increases as you move down the group. Okay, so the farther down you go, the more reactive it is. Now, this, when we label group one as alkali metals, we're talking about everything except for hydrogen. Because what we're going to talk about in a minute is if you notice, hydrogen is a different color. It's not a metal. So it's in group one because it has one valence electron, but it's not a metal, so it's not technically an alkali metal like lithium through francium. All right, group two is called the alkaline earth metals. Um, group three are the rare earth metals, so these two groups contain metals that um, make up the earth's crust. Groups three through twelve, so group three is a rare, are the rare earth metals, but they're also transition metals. And then the, the 13, 14, etc. after that kind of have boring names. It's like the boron group, the carbon group, the oxygen group, the nitrogen group, etc. Um, so we kind of, I don't really care if you know those, but I do want you to know that group 17 is the group of halogens. These are the most reactive non-metals, because if you go back to our periodic table here, you see they're purple, they're all non-metals. These are the most reactive non-metals, they really want to bond with other things, and their reactivity actually decreases as you move down the group. So metals increases, non-metals decreases. So the most reactive non-metal is fluorine and the most reactive metal is francium, so they're opposite of each other. And then the last group name I want you to know are is group 18, which are the noble gases. These are non-reactive elements. 
because they are chemically stable. And we'll learn a lot more about what that means in our next unit. But in basically what it means is that they have full energy levels of electrons. Their outer energy levels are full. They can't hold anymore. So they don't want to react with other things. Now in terms of labeling your periodic table, if that's something you want to do, we've got the alkali metals. Note that my arrow is not including hydrogen. I blocked through it. We've got the alkaline earth metals, the rare earth metals, this whole section is transition metals, then the boron group, carbon group, nitrogen group, oxygen group. Those are all boring names. I don't really care if you know those as much. But I do want you to know halogens and noble gases. All right, that is the different columns or the groups. Now we're going to talk through the rows or the periods. So periods are the horizontal rows on the periodic table. All elements in the same period have the same number of energy levels in their electron cloud. So that's something that's really interesting. So remember, all atoms have a nucleus with protons and neutrons, and that's surrounded by an electron cloud with E, which is subdivided into shells or energy levels, and each one holds a certain number of electrons, and this is something you need to memorize. So level one, which is closest to the nucleus, only holds a max of two electrons. Level 2 holds up to 8. Level 3 holds up to 8 for our purposes, and level 4 holds up to 18 for our purposes. Now, these levels and the higher up levels get a little bit more complex in terms of electron arrangement, and you're going to learn about that more in chemistry. So for my class, we're only going to look at elements that kind of follow this pattern just to keep it simple so you can get a basic understanding of energy levels and how many electrons they hold. But do know you're going to learn more about that when you get to chemistry. All right, so looking at our PR table, this is my first energy level. This is, uh, or excuse me, my first period, and they everything in this period, hydrogen and helium, has one energy level. And then we have two energy levels, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, now let's combine what we've learned about atomic structure and what we now understand about the periodic table. An element's location on the periodic table informs us about its atomic structure. So where it is on the periodic table tells me about how it is structurally. So for example, let's talk about magnesium. It's in group two. What does that mean? It means it has two valence electrons, all right, which we can see in this drawing. It's also in period three. What does that mean? That means it must have three energy levels, which we can see in this drawing because it has three black rings surrounding it. We're gonna learn how to draw these in just a second. One last thing I wanna talk about before we learn to draw though is classification of the elements. So I want to talk about these three colors you see on my periodic table. All elements on the periodic table are classified as either metals, nonmetals, or metalloids. So metals, which is kind of like my teal color on my periodic table right here, they are all of these that are teal. They are shiny, silvery solids. They are really good conductors of heat and electricity. They are malleable and ductile and they tend to be located to the left of the metalloids, which we see here. Now, one thing I didn't even mention is down here, all of these elements kind of fit in right here. Like this whole top row would just be squeezed right here, and this whole row would be squeezed right here. We won't really get into these at all this year, um, but just so you're like, why have you not mentioned those? They all squeeze in right there. All right. The purple, that's my nonmetals. They tend to be gases or dull, brittle solids. Um, and I love this periodic table especially because um, the solids are all black in name and then the liquids are red and then the gases are in white. So what you can see is we actually have bromine, which is actually a liquid, but, and it's a nonmetal. But in general, they tend to be gases or dull, brittle solids. They are not good conductors at all. And they are to the right of the metalloids other than hydrogen. Hydrogen is the only one that's over there. All right, so what are these metalloids I keep speaking of? They are the ones in orange. And sometimes on a periodic table, you'll kind of see a stair-step line to help you remember where they are. They are all solids. They are semiconductors, so they can kind of conduct stuff. They, are, um, they have physical properties like metals, but they have chemical properties like nonmetals, which is kind of interesting. Now... All of that background info 
to say, I now want to teach you how to do a bore model drawing. Remember, a bore model, it's just going to be a diagram that's going to show us the structure of an atom, a simple, simple structure. Remember, this technically isn't the most accurate. Um, it's really the electrons aren't in these perfect little orbits like this, but they are contained in shells, and so that's why we draw it this way because we can't really draw an animation very easily. And you're going to learn how to draw these now, and then we're going to practice. So, here's how you draw them. First, you figure out the number of protons by looking at the atom, uh, the, excuse me, the element's atomic number. And then you determine the number of neutrons by subtracting. So you take your mass number minus your atomic number to get your neutrons. Then you're going to write the number of protons and neutrons in the center of your nucleus, because that's where they're located in the atom. Then you're going to use the period number on the periodic table to determine the number of energy levels in the electron cloud. And you'll draw these around the nucleus. So that's going to be your number of circles around the nucleus. Then you'll put the electrons on each level, filling from the inside out. Remember, we're just going to assume the atom is electrically neutral. So its total number of E is the total number of protons. So if we're drawing carbon, which has an atomic number of 6, it has 6 protons. So we will assume it's electrically neutral and has six total electrons. So you would put two on the innermost layer, because that's all it can hold, leaving four on the outermost layer. So you fill from the inside out. Last but not least, to double check that you did it right, check that your number of valence electrons is the same as your group number, because that's how you'll know if you did it right. So carbon's in group 14, so it should have four valence electrons. All right, so... Complete a Bohr model drawing of nitrogen. So first, let's determine the number of protons in um, by the uh, element atomic number. So nitrogen is number seven, so it should have seven protons. Now, determine the number of neutrons by subtracting. Mass number minus atomic number. So if I don't give you the mass number, then I'm probably just wanting you to draw the most common version of the element. So for nitrogen, that would be nitrogen 14 based on the average atomic mass. And 14 minus 7 is 7. So there should be 7 neutrons in this atom. So we're going to place the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So there's my 7 protons and my 7 neutrons. Next, we use a period number to figure out the number of energy levels. So nitrogen is in the second row, so the second period. So there should be 2 energy levels. That's why I have 2 circles around the nucleus. Then I add my electrons, filling from the inside out. If there's seven protons, that means there'll be seven total electrons. Remember, two go on the inside. We fill the maximum out first. That leaves five for the outside. To double check, determine that my number of valence electrons matches the group number. Nitrogen's in group 15, so it should have five valence electrons, and it does, so we know we did it right. And now we're going to practice Bohr model drawings.